Hey, thanks, Emily. Um, so I want to uh, give a brief overview first of what Corrode is and what it is not, and I'd like you to hold questions while I do that. But uh, once I've gotten through that, we'll have an intermission. I'd like to welcome any questions then and throughout the rest of the talk. Um, at that point, uh, I want to also talk about testing and community building. So, um, so what does Corrode do? Corrode is a tool for automatically translating C source programs into Rust source code. Um, in the process, it's a, it's a semantics preserving translation. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and uh, it has a nice side effect of, um, of making things that are implicit about C explicit in the Rust source. So it's, um, it's got a number of useful uh, side effects when you, you run Corrode on C source. You, you learn some things about what your C actually meant that you may not have realized. So let, let's talk about those things. Um, so semantics preserving. Uh, what does this expression A plus B in a C program actually mean? Anyone want to throw out some So addition, yeah? It depends on the types. That's the key thing. Um, so for example, if these are both of type int, then it's uh, signed integer addition, uh, probably 32-bit on any platform you're likely to be working with, but not necessarily. Um, if, one of, if either A or B is a pointer and the other one is an integer type, then this is pointer arithmetic. Um, what were the other cases? There's, uh, I guess the big thing is that uh, on the, the integer math or, um, or floating point math, there are a whole bunch of rules about uh, what to do if those aren't, if A and B don't have the same type. Um, or even if they do have the same type, if their type is narrower than int. This, it's all very complicated. Um, I'll, I'll give a little bit of an example of that a bit later. But, um, the, the key thing is that um, Corrode goes to a lot of trouble to make sure that the Rust that it generates, um, as best I can figure anyway, <laughs> matches um, what the C specification says, you know, it does exactly the same thing, right? So the C abstract machine um, specification in C99 or C11 or whatever, whatever version of the C standard you're looking at, um, if you follow the directions that that says uh, your program th that describes, um, if you follow the steps that the abstract machine specification says your program should go through, then um, and look at the generated Rust, you should see the Rust going through those same steps. Um, but semantics preserving isn't actually uh, the only interesting thing, uh, only interesting constraint I imposed on what I wanted Corrode to do. Um, I also wanted Corrode to uh, preserve the structure of the source program as much as possible. Uh, and that turns out to be particularly tricky. Um, let's just take one of the most uh, easiest to explain examples of uh, if you have any go-tos in your C program, since Rust doesn't have any go-tos in the language, any support for go-to. That's just not a thing. Um, so if you want to try and, try and transform a C program that has go-tos into a Rust program, you're probably going to have a hard time preserving the, the, the order that the statements were in, uh, in, your, in your original C source. But for the most part, you know, there's, there's a lot where, a lot of overlap between C and Rust, and that's kind of deliberate on the Rust designer's part, right? Um, that, uh, that it should be familiar to C programmers or C++ programmers, um, even when it's not quite the same. And so there's, there's a lot you can get from just doing kind of a naive uh, syntax directed well, this is a while loop in C, so I'm going to construct a while loop here in Rust. 
or an if statement in C, so I'm going to construct an if statement in Rust, things like that. So that's, um, that's the kinds of things uh, Corrode is trying to do. Um, as an example of, um, of the sorts of complexity you get from, um, from the different uh, arithmetic conversion rules and interpromotion rules and all those sorts of things, here is, uh, here is an example where I've got, and I can't actually see my screens here, so I'm kind of parrying at it. Um, <laughs> got several different types of, uh, of integer values. I've got a uh, probably 8-bit um, unsigned char. I've got a long, which might be 32 or 64 bits, say, um, but it's uh, casting a long from a, uh, a number that C interprets as an int. Um, then there's another number that C is going to interpret as an unsigned int, uh, at least on the usual platforms, um, because of magic. <laughs> and then I cast that to a short. Uh, and the end result is that, um, that the Rust equivalent has a whole bunch of explicit casts in it. Um, we have to convert the... Um, we have the, the three turned into a uh, explicitly typed 32-bit integer, but then that has to get cast to uh, I don't remember what I used i size. Um, the uh, there's an unsigned 32-bit value that then gets truncated by casting to a signed 16-bit value, and then gets cast again to widen it back out to the type that we're trying to do the whole computation in, and finally the um, the char also has to get widened. So all these things, there were a bunch of steps that were implicit in the original C source, and the translation to Rust made them all explicit. And I've, I've found that super helpful for, uh, for my own learning uh, in terms of figuring out what C actually does, if nothing else. But there are some things that uh, Corrode is explicitly not meant to do. Um, so one thing that uh, Corrode is not meant to do is generate idiomatic Rust. Uh, Emily had proposed that uh, a, a alternate talk title for this would be um, Rust anti-patterns or design anti-patterns is a nice contrast with the, uh, the talk we just saw. So um, for a simple example, if you've got a for loop, and this is like the most idiomatic for loop in C, right? It's just trying to go uh, take a, a, a variable named i from 0 up to 10 uh, exclusive. Um, the idiomatic Rust for this is a nice simple Rust for loop using a, um, a range expression. Um, it's possible that I have an off by one because I continue getting confused about how Rust range expressions work, but uh, it's something like this anyway. Um, Corrode generates this crap. <laughs> um, so it's, it's directly translating what you asked for, not what you meant, right? It doesn't know what you meant. Um, one of the things that I would love to see someone maybe come do as, as follow-on work <laughs> is a tool that recognizes these kinds of, uh, of syntactic anti-patterns and, uh, and tries to either just suggest fixes or, um, or automatically apply them where, where it's you know, obvious what the programmer meant. Um, as a relevant piece in that direction, uh, if you've been working with Rust for a bit, you've probably seen Clippy. If you haven't seen Clippy, you need to check it out. <laughs> it is an amazing tool that's full of, um, full of all sorts of uh, advice of it'll you know analyze your source code and tell you hey here's this thing you did it might not be the way you actually wanted to do it here's a suggestion about how to fix it so um, so Clippy would be an excellent example of the sort of tool that would be useful for cleaning up output from corrode um, the the only you know even better thing would be right uh, having it automatically make the changes it suggested. Um, oh, 
Uh, the other thing that Crow doesn't do yet is translate all of C. Um, so there are uh, there are constructs um, that it just won't touch right now. Uh, it won't handle switch statements at the moment, for example, for the same reason that it doesn't handle uh, go to yet. There's a lot of uh, terrifying control flow things you can do with switch statements. Um, there's a variety of other things that it, it uh, either doesn't even try to translate and will just report an error, or it tries to translate it and gets it wrong. I mostly try to at least uh, detect if I'm going to get it wrong and refuse, but uh, it's, it's not even always perfect at that. Um, so we'll cover some examples of that a bit later. Um, so with that overview of what Corrode is trying to do and what Corrode is not trying to do, are there any questions so far? A couple in the back there. What's the biggest program you've tried it on? Um, I'll give the example in a, a little bit, some numbers on uh, muscle libc. Um, I also tried it on uh, the Linux kernel. And uh, I was successfully able to translate one source file in the Linux kernel. Um, it was named empty.c. <laughs> Turns out the Linux kernel, uh, every source file indirectly includes compiler.h, and there's a static inline function in there that has a switch statement or something. So I just completely fail on everything. <laughs> I thought there was another question in the back. Yeah, on your previous slide, you had uh, the for statement. It's kind of weird as the mm -hmm. plus plus is, is a prefix instead of a, as a post. Sure. So it's weird. Is that just? That's, um, that's a matter of personal preference. Uh, the, the, um, it doesn't make any difference in that for loop whether that's a prefix or postfix increment. Um, I did have a teacher once who insisted that uh, you should choose one way or the other, I forget which way, because of, uh, of a compiler, uh, whether the compiler would generate more efficient code or not, which is utterly bogus, at least on today's compilers. But <laughs> So um, something when I was looking at this that occurred to me immediately is how the heck are you squaring the scoping differences between like C and Rust? Because there's some awesome scoping stuff I know you can do in Rust, and I was trying to remember the particulars in C, and like, I, I can remember enough to know they're not the same, like, you know, if and for, like, so how are you kind of navigating that? Um, now, by scoping, you just mean the, the visibility of variable declarations yeah. in different scopes. Um, that mostly fell out naturally. Um, there's stuff you can do in Rust that you can't do in C, um, but that's fine, right? I only need to be able to do everything that C can do in Rust. <laughs> um, there are a number of interesting cases where um, wildly different looking things in C generate the same Rust. Um, for example, if statements and ternary conditionals both translate to if expressions in Rust. Um, what was another example? Uh, I had one in my head a second ago, I don't remember. But, um, but that's come up a few times. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but. Yeah, I think probably. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So C is notorious for having a bunch of things where it's the spec's undefined or yes. vague or terrible. Yes. Um, so what do you do with all those things? So an interesting um, thing about that is undefined behavior means the compiler is allowed to do whatever it wants, right? And so I'm allowed to make Corrode do whatever I want it to. Right. Um, what I've been trying to do is be kind to the programmer <laughs> as much as possible. Uh, so, for example, um, signed integer overflow is undefined in C. Uh, if you have a signed integer variable and it's at the maximum value that, that type can represent and you add one to it, uh, 
C does not specify what your program will do at that point. It's uh, the, the usual sort of joke is it's allowed to delete your hard drive or you know, kill kittens or whatever. So, um, so that's not very, very friendly, which is why in Rust, um, they made the decision that uh, signed integer overflow would, in uh, debug builds, panic. And in release builds, uh, unless you specifically turn on the panicking behavior, which you can also do, uh, in release builds, it would uh, wrap, which is what programmers usually expected it to do anyway. <laughs> um, and so what I've done with Corrode is for signed, um, signed arithmetic, I just translate it, you know, if you have a plus operator in C, it translates directly to the plus operator in Rust. And that has the nice advantage that your Rust is about as readable as your C was, uh, which may be not very. Um, it also means that, uh, that suddenly you've gone from a program where you have no idea what it does to a program where it will panic if in the cases where uh, C didn't specify what it would do. So this is, I would argue, a lot more friendly <laughs> to, to the programmer. And there are other cases, um, I can't remember any offhand, but where uh, when faced with undefined behavior, I chose to do the thing that I thought the programmer probably expected. Um, so yeah, that's been an, an interesting, uh, interesting case, right? Deciding what exactly to do with all the undefined cases in the C-spec. And I'm, I'm trying to be as, as generous as possible to programmers when I do that. Other questions? Are you using an existing C front end or are you rolling your own? I guess one of the things that I, I haven't mentioned yet is anything about how I've implemented Corrode. Um, so it's a C to Rust translator, so there's already two programming languages involved. Naturally, I decided to add a third to the mix. Um, so the implementation is written in Haskell. And the reason for that is, to get to your question, that uh, the only C front end that I could find that was usable for me was one I knew uh, how to use in Haskell. Um, I, I tried at first to write Corrode in Rust, and um, basically everything I've, I've done would be easy to write in Rust, except that uh, the only half reasonable C front end I could find was uh, the, the Rust bindings to libclang. And libclang, which is the C wrapper around the C++ API in Clang, uh, doesn't expose everything that you need from the abstract syntax tree. So I got down to the point where I could look at an expression and it would tell me, hey, this is an expression. And I'd be like, great, which operator is it? And it would tell me, I don't know. And I'd dig a little further and be like, this is a thing. I'm like, what kind of thing? I know it's a variable. Why can't you tell me it's a variable? Um, so that didn't work. <laughs> so I used uh, the language C package in Haskell, and um, that's been really nice. Uh, so to answer your question, yes, I'm using an existing C front end, and, and it's, it's one in Haskell. Well, maybe this is something you were planning on getting into, but I'm curious to see how the borrow system interacts with this. So are there borrow checking problems you can catch in your C programs when you translate it into Rust? That would be awesome. Um, unfortunately, what I'm doing is I'm translating all of the unsafe uh, C pointer um, operations into unsafe Rust pointer operations. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, that's in the category of, uh, you know, it's generating sort of Rust anti-patterns, right? A follow-on tool that would do um, some kind of borrow inference uh, and work out, like try to automatically work out cases where you could replace the raw pointers with proper borrows. That would be awesome. I'd love to see someone explore that. I think that's sort of maybe grad student work or something, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to propose that as, uh, hey, this should be your next open source project unless you happen to be a grad student already. Yeah, I thought maybe you could <laughs> just generate, uh, you know, instead of doing borrow inference in the C code, just generate Rust code and let Rust do the borrow um, inference. But 
So, but I suppose that would mean that every time you operate it on a player, you'd have to just follow the same pattern. Yeah. Even uh, though it's, maybe it's there should be some different patterns. Yeah. You'd wind up um, <laughs> you'd wind up with most of your code getting rejected for kind yeah. of spurious reasons. <laughs> right. Um, so I I chose to do the thing that lets you quickly get to. Uh, to Rust that does the same thing that you're, you know, it's exactly as safe as your original C program was, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then you can go through and hand edit it and yes. right. make those improvements. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so every function uh, that I generate is marked as an unsafe function. <laughs> Which seems fair, right? <laughs> sure. Uh, shall we move on? Um, so I've got two more um, sections I want to talk about here. The first is testing. Um, how can I have any confidence that the Rust code that I generated uh, actually does the same thing as the C code that you handed it? Uh, I mean, the first answer, of course, is that I'm trying to uh, trying to construct things. You know, construct the source code of Corrode following the C99 spec or the C11 spec. Um, so there's a certain amount of, well, I believe this is correct because you can sort of trace between this line of code and this piece of the specification. Um, but that's a very hand-wavy argument, right? I'm, I'm not, uh, not doing anything, I don't have any tools, you know, checking that. And so we can't really rely on that. Um, so there's some other cool, uh, cool tricks, and I'm going to talk about them specifically in the context of Corrode, but I think they're informative for um, software development in general. Uh, they're, they're underutilized uh, tools. So the, the big thing here is um, uh, randomized testing and delta debugging. Um, so there's a tool called CSmith, um, this really nice uh, tool from University of Utah, I think, um, that generates random C programs. That's all it does. Just, just uh, I want a C program. Here's, give me a source file. Uh, it'll have some number of functions in it, uh, some number of global variables, some number of structs and unions and enums and whatever, and each function will have some number of statements, which may be if statements or uh, or just simple statements or while loops or whatever, and each time it's trying to insert another thing, it randomly chooses which thing to insert next. Um, they've done a number of things like, uh, you know, it's, it's only pseudo-random, of course, and so if you give it the same seed and the same configuration flags, you'll get the same source file out. Um, Things like that. So that's that's uh, super useful f because uh, when you want to um, want to uh, just share. Um, no, I don't actually want to say why that's useful. That's that's just useful. I'll stop there. Um, but uh, so I can generate random C source files, and then what I can do with them is uh, try compiling them with GCC or Clang. Um, and get an, a binary out, and I can run that, and I can see what it does. And I can also translate it using Corrode, compile the output of Corrode using Rust C, get a binary out of that, see what it does. And if they do the same thing, that's nice. And if they do something different, well, I have a bug, and I'd better figure out what it is. <laughs> um, so I, I now have a little... Um, little Python script in the Corrode repository that you can run if you want to that uh, just repeatedly runs CSmith, uh, tries, tries this testing strategy, right? Uh, see whether, whether both versions, both binaries produce the same output. And if they don't, well then the question is, how do I find this bug? I now have a thousand, several thousand line source file. Somewhere in it I translated something wrong. Um, and it's not just that it's several thousand lines, right? Each line uh, is likely to have some ginormous expression that's utterly meaningless, <laughs> right? So I can't just stare at it and say, oh, I know, I, I did, you know, 
left shift wrong again. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's where the second piece comes in from the same people because they had the same problem. Um, this is a tool called CReduce. And what it does is it goes and tries deleting parts of the program. Just, just delete stuff. Uh, the big, biggest thing, and the thing it spends the most time doing is just randomly choosing lines to delete, seeing what happens. Um, but it has some other tricks it does to, uh, to be a little more efficient sometimes. Um, so the trick here is, uh, you know, I ran CSmith, I got a program that um, failed this, this test of uh, the two different programs produce different results. Um, I want to get another program that is smaller but fails in the exact same way. <laughs> and figuring out how to specify what fails in the same way means gets a little tricky. But, um, but once you've figured out how to specify that, then you just give CReduce your, um, here's the bug I'm looking for. Keep deleting things until you don't see that bug anymore. And then back off and try deleting other things, right? So you only delete things that weren't important to the bug you were, you're facing. Um, and this has been super helpful in, uh, in helping me track down, you know, going from those several thousand line source files to, oh, here's the five lines that I need to feed corrode to get a wrong output. And that is amazing. So um, that general technique is called delta debugging. C reduce is specifically targeted at, uh, at C source, but there are other tools for doing this kind of thing on um, other kinds of files. And these, these both, both the randomized testing and the delta debugging are super useful techniques. Um, and I recommend you, you see whether you can apply them to, you know, problems you run into. Um, the, another way that I've been testing corrode is by trying to take uh, the muscle C library, which is meant to be a small lightweight implementation of all the sorts of things that you expect normally to have in a, a full C environment. So your printf implementation and your mem copy and uh, add exit and all the, all the usual sorts of things that the C standard specifies or that POSIX specifies, those sorts of things. So there's uh, something like 1,300 uh, C source files that are actually getting built on, uh, on my laptop on an x86-64 system. Um, Corrode is currently able to translate about 20% of those to Rust, which I feel pretty good about, frankly. <laughs> um, of those, uh, there's, what is that, about 70 source files that um, Corrode translated, but they didn't compile correctly when I ran them through Rusty. Um, there's a number of different reasons that that comes up. Uh, the biggest, the, the most common one is that uh, Muscle has a fairly common pattern, and I can't even say they're wrong to do this, <laughs> of um, declaring a vari variable that's uninitialized, passing it by reference to a function um, where the function doesn't read that variable, it only writes to it. And then when the function returns, then they'll read it. And Rust doesn't know how to, how to deal with that. Um, so Rust just says, ah, this looks like it might be uninitialized. I refuse. Um, I haven't quite decided what I want to do about that. There are, there are tricks we could play um, in the translation um, using weird Rust internal things, uh, the uninitialized function and stuff. But, um, but I kind of hate to do that. There are a few other kinds of bugs. Um, I'm trying to remember what I even noted the bugs were. Uh, there's some problems with global initializers where uh, Rust refuses to let me declare something that, you know, it's, it's sort of obvious what its value should be um, at compile time, but Rust doesn't believe that it knows what its value is at compile time. Um, some other sorts of issues. Uh, there's some bugs in the translation of arrays, things like that. But um, 
And, and then there's the other, the other point that I haven't actually figured out how to get uh, all of the resulting object files to link into <laughs> muscle libc uh, that I can actually test. So uh, I don't know whether any of that code is translated correctly, but uh, you know, it, it seems promising. There's, um, there's a lot that's already working there, I guess is my point. The other thing to note about muscle libc is that a big chunk of it is inline assembly. And since I'm not translating that at all yet, um, <laughs> that'll be a pretty substantial chunk of the remaining 80%. <laughs> um, but I started trying to figure out how Rust's inline assembly syntax was supposed to work and got confused and, and decided I would go do something else. Um, so any, um, any questions about uh, the testing process here? Shall I move on to the last section of the talk? I guess there's one over there. What do you do if the program you're running gets an infinite loop? Do you have a certain timeout and kill the yeah, process? Yeah, the CSmith generated yeah. programs. Yeah, it's, um, the, the CSmith developers and the CReducer developers recommend having a timeout because there's no <laughs> guarantee that CSmith will generate terminating programs. <laughs> uh, most obnoxious cases I've run into actually have been cases where um, it wasn't actually in an infinite loop, but uh, it was Just slow. so close <laughs> to my timeout that one version would terminate and the other one wouldn't within the timeout. Um, and the timeout I set was eight seconds, but you know, you pick any timeout and you're going to get... <laughs> some programs being right at that edge just randomly. Oh, another thing is the, you talked earlier about things that are unspecified in the C specification, but you made decisions about those in Rust, so well, yeah. Well, so C, C, C Smith uh, goes to a lot of trouble to avoid undefined behavior in the programs it generates. So that hasn't been so much of an issue. Okay, thanks. That seems like a gap in your testing because you were saying earlier about how you want to take advantage of the undefined behavior. So do you have an idea for how you might test that in the future? No, I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> Easy, thanks. Next question. <laughs> So when the C reduce is running, is that also smart about keeping the, the deleted parts keeping a legal program? How does that? You have to be careful uh, when you write your, um, when you use C reduce, you give it, here's a, usually a shell script or something, I happen to be using a Python script, uh, that needs to exit with success if this is a version I want to keep or failure otherwise or maybe it's the other way around. That, that was, got very confusing. But um, so you have to make sure that the script you provided is actually checking for the thing you meant to check for. Otherwise, it's very easy to wind up with um, C-Reduce just deleting the entire contents of the file and saying, hey, I found a different bug, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's tricky. <laughs> So an another question I had on the Musil part, when you're talking about linking that, I guess with only 20% built, are you trying to link the other 80% that was built normally? Yeah, so I, I wrote a little script that um, tries to run Corrode and Rust-C, but uh, if that fails, then it runs GCC with the original arguments. Um, so you always wind up with an object file. It just might not be one that passed through Corrode. So um, right now my... I, um, I stopped at, uh, I need to get the implementation of the Rust panic function from somewhere. Because <laughs> um, the compiler is happily generating calls to panic in some of the translated code. Uh, and I haven't decided how I'm going to handle that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about um, community and uh, contributing. Um, one of the things that I really wanted out of this project was I wanted to get uh, 
get other people involved in it. Um, that's been one of my key goals uh, from not quite the start, because uh, at first it was just, hey, this seems fun, let's try it, see how far I could get. But as soon as I started discovering that it was actually kind of working, um, it is so much more fun if you've got other people uh, hacking on fun stuff like this too. So um, I want to talk about a couple specific things that I've been doing to try to uh, help people get started and, uh, and encourage people to participate. These aren't the only things I've tried, but, um, but they're the most interesting, I think. So um, one of them is a technique generally called literate programming. What I've got is, uh, let's see if I can hit the right, yes. Um, the source file for, um, for most of Corrode is, um, is a markdown file that has Haskell source um, interspersed in it. And so I can use um, Pandoc to generate a PDF from this or um, GitHub with a little bit of hackery will just render it nicely as HTML. Um, and the result is I have 41 pages of internals documentation that's executable, right? <laughs> this is the implementation. Um, and I can throw in, uh, throw in snippets of C or Rust source uh, to illustrate various points and have them be nicely pretty printed and everything too, um, syntax highlighted I mean. Um, so this has been really cool, I think. Um, it's, it's encouraged people to actually keep the documentation up to date as they're working on features um, because all of the internals documentation is right there in the source that they're hacking on. Um, it's been helpful for people trying to get started. You know, they can look through this and, and uh, hopefully have a better idea than just trying to read my somewhat dense Haskell source. Um, so this has been a really neat trick and, uh, and I think people should try using literate programming more often. Um, I'm hand waving a little, it, you know, if you asked Don Knuth uh, what literate programming is, this is, um, this is not quite everything that he would have described it as, but um, but this has been enough uh, to get the advantages that I wanted to get out of it. Um, the other major thing that I've done to try to encourage people to participate is I'm using GitHub as my, my uh, source hosting and GitHub has a reasonably good um, issue tracking thing built in for every repository. And so I just created some issues in the, in the GitHub repository and added a tag to them that said easy. Um, and you know, in a project like this, easy is a relative term. But, um, but I tried to go for things where, you know, if you got the right five lines of code or so, uh, you would have successfully solved the, some open issue in Corrode. Um, and I've had uh, one person in particular who, um, who started off just uh, doing a couple of those easy issues and then just went off to, uh, well I mentioned that it's, it's 41 pages of, of uh, internals documentation right now. He's probably responsible for five or ten of those. Um, so this is a, a great way to, uh, in whatever open source project you're doing, uh, encourage people to get started and then once they've got that initial momentum, they're, they're much more likely to continue on and contribute greater things to what you're doing. Um, the Rust project does this and I definitely recommend checking out, uh, you know, Rust compiler or standard library, uh, easy tagged bugs. Um, and it's a thing I think more open source projects should do. So, um, that is my 
overview of Corrode and some techniques I'd like to encourage people to, to try in your own projects. Um, I think we have time for a few more questions, Emily? Sounds like, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, so right near the beginning, you said the primary limitations like uh, control flow wise go to and switch. Do you have an idea about how you might handle that in Rust? I do. <laughs> Unlike your last question, I have an answer for this one. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, um, there are academic papers going back to the 1970s or thereabouts on basically this question. Um, the, so the, the general question uh, was, you know, we had these programming languages, the early programming languages, uh, assembly languages, and, and uh, the, the earliest high-level languages that were built sort of entirely around unstructured control flow. You'd have if statements and go-tos, and that was kind of your, uh, kind of all you got. Um, and then people started arguing, well, you know, go-tos may be a bad idea. We're winding up with all this messy code. Um, so are we losing anything by, um, by maybe just removing go-to from our languages? Uh, and obviously the, the Rust language developers have decided that no, we're not losing enough to justify it because they did, right? Um, Java had made the same choice uh, about 20 years earlier. Um, so is Python, so have a bunch of other languages that, that people are happily writing software in, right? Um, so, uh, but there's the, the um, result of, of all these different academic researchers asking, you know, uh, what happens if we just don't have go-to in our language was a whole bunch of papers saying, well, here's how you can translate um, something that has go-tos into something that doesn't. Um, and they vary uh, in terms of uh, what they assume the target language does have. Um, for example, uh, Rust and Java both have uh, labeled loops. So you can break out of a loop um, that's not just the innermost closing loop. Um, and that lets you capture some go-to patterns cleanly that you can't, uh, can't easily capture otherwise. Um, and so some papers assume that your language has that and others don't. And um, some papers uh, talk about, uh, well, these are the kinds of programs we can translate and for anything else we have to just throw up our hands and say no. Um, other papers say, well, all right, if you decide you still want to translate those programs that have what's called irreproduci or irreducible control flow, um, then here are things you can do. You can duplicate sections of code or you can add Boolean variables or... Um, so there's, there's a bunch of research um, that, that addresses this question of how do we do this. And it's mostly a matter of uh, someone deciding it's, it's time to actually do it in Corrode. Um, there's some tricky bits in C in particular uh, because when you use goto to branch past um, a variable declaration, um, C ha uh, is very specific about uh, what, whether the the uh, contents of that variable are defined or not. <laughs> um, and you might branch past that variable declaration multiple times and you have to figure out whether, you, whether that variable went out of scope since the last time that you branched past it. And um, so all of that gets, uh, gets nasty and figuring out how to keep track of, of all the relevant information in order to preserve C semantics is tricky. And then, of course, there's the fact that I really want, uh, if you have simple control flow, if you wrote an if statement, I'd like you to wind up with an if statement in the same spot in your generated Rust. Um, I'd like to preserve the order that variable declarations happen in, preferably including if you interleaved those variable declarations with other code. Um, so again, there's, there's sort of a bunch of bookkeeping to do to get all of this right. 
but um, I have a rough idea how to do that. There's an open GitHub issue uh, on Corrode with a whole bunch of discussion from several different people on how we could handle go-tos and switch. Um, and I'd love to see someone pick it up. <laughs> Other questions? Um, so since you're using Haskell, I'm just curious, uh, have you made use of their abundance of parser libraries per chance, or is libc taking care of most of your needs? Uh, language C is doing all of the parsing I need. Um, there's an interesting question about, um, so one of the limitations of Corrode currently is that it has to operate on C source that's already been pre-processed. Um, and that means that if you have C preprocessor macros or things like that, those don't show up uh, with the same structure in the generated Rust. Um, so it, it would be nice, maybe, to have some kind of, I'm not even quite sure what this looks like, some kind of more clever parser that knows how to deal with uh, interleaved C preprocessor tokens and uh, and actual C tokens, right? Um, and so I thought a little bit about maybe it's worth um, rewriting the entire C parser to do that, but uh, it's certainly not worth doing soon, I think. <laughs> Was there any part of writing this in Haskell where you thought that I wish I could write this in Rust in a different way? Um, no, I don't think there's anything uh, where I felt Rust would have made it easier to write Corrode. Um, but one of the things I've been trying to do is um, I've been trying to make sure that I can at least have a hand wavy justification for everything I use in the Haskell where I could say, if someone who knows Rust came to me and asked, what does this mean? I can say, oh, this is just like this thing in Rust. Um, so I've been trying not to use, there's, there's plenty of magic that, that people have, uh, have added to GHC over the last 20 years, but trying not to use uh, anything that's too magic. Um, Generally, uh, also trying not to use very many libraries, uh, which mostly hasn't been a big deal. Um, so this is maybe maybe some of the most Rust-like Haskell <laughs> anyone's written, but um, but no, I don't think there's been anything where I wished I had a particular Rust feature. The main main reason for that, I think, is because uh, Rust borrowed so many things from Haskell anyway that it's. <laughs> Okay, that looks like it. Thank you very much, Jamie.